has a new Tesa, and she is really, really good. So in this video, I'm going to break down how to use her best and provide a fully functioning deck for you to copy, steal, or build off of. We're heading back to Ravnica again. So R&D had the bold thought, what if we did a Tesa? But again, Tesa Opulent Oligarch costs one generic, one white, and one black mana for a 2-3 legendary human advisor with Death Touch. At the beginning of your end step, investigate for each opponent who lost life this turn. And then, whenever a clue you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, create a 1-1 white and black spirit creature token with flying. This ability triggers only once each turn. The first thing you're probably thinking is the first thing that I was thinking, which is, damn, she is opulent as heck. Check out the poofy shoulders. Check out the gold pop collar. And check out that pimp cane. And check out that stance that just screams, yes, girl, slay. I am an adult, by the way, just in case my riz happened to fool you. I think this video deserves a like for my mastery of the youth verbiage. Don't you agree? So let's break down Tesa, Opulent Oligarch, and see what the best ways to exploit her are. She has Death Touch, and that's fine. It, it could make people not want to block her, so in a tight spot you can attack with her, maybe cause a loss of life to get a trigger, but that's you in a really bad situation. The first major ability is the Investigate. At the beginning of the end step, investigate for each opponent who lost life this turn. Investigate just means that you put a clue token into play. And if you don't know, a clue token is an artifact token with the subtype of clue, and it has an activated ability. Pay two colorless mana and sacrifice it to draw a card. So at the beginning of your end step, you get a clue token for each opponent who lost life, which means you'll want to damage or cause loss of life to all of your opponents to get the maximum of three clues at the end of your turn. Since this triggers at the beginning of your end step, you can use abilities that cause mass loss of life at sorcery speed, or even the ones that trigger at the beginning of your end step. Since it's your turn, you can stack priority so that the damage resolves first, and then Taze's ability. Be wary of cards that will deal mass damage on your upkeep. They will generally be passive and not require any further costs, but they won't trigger Taze until your next turn, the one after they come into play. Also, Tesa doesn't look for loss of life on other players' turns, so getting damage that can be dealt at instant speed isn't worth any extra cost. So, one of the priorities of this deck will be dealing table-wide damage on your turn. Tesa's next ability is whenever a clue you control is put into the graveyard from a battlefield, create a 1-1 white and black spirit creature token with flying. This can happen once a turn. There are a few key things to keep in mind for this. The clue doesn't have to be sacrificed through its own ability to trigger this. You can also use it in conjunction with one of the millions of other aristocrat cards that Orzov has. And that's going to be one of the other priorities for this deck, sacrificing your stuff for various effects. The downside is that this ability only works once a turn. Now the good part is that it will work on every turn, yours and your opponents. So for the aristocratic sacrifice outlets, you generally want things that can be done at instant speed. This way you can get a sacrifice on your turn and all three of your opponent's turns, netting up to four spirits around you end up having a growing army of spirits, which are not super intimidating by themselves. So we're going to be using enhancements to make them much more threatening. These are going to be the traditional cards you see in token strategies to make them really, really big. That'll be the last priority for this deck, making our tokens super, super big. We've got our shiny new commander and we've got a good idea of how to use it. We're gonna focus on being a half aristocratic, half token deck, when you see this symbol, it means that any card that appears on the left like this is a suitable replacement for any of the cards in that particular section. Also, I do not run Soul Ring or Arcane Signet in my decks, but you can definitely go for it if you want. I'm not the fun police. The first section are the cards which will deal damage to the entire table, and we're going to start with Corpse Knight and Warnog, Writer's Chaplain. Corpse Knight is great, especially when you cast it on turn 2 and then Tesa on turn 3. That'll trigger the Corpse Knight and then in turn, trigger Tesa. We're not cast after Taysa, so we'll get your clues the easy way or the hard way. Dogged Pursuit and Great Unclean One will trigger Taysa at the end of your turn. Make sure to stack the effects correctly so the loss of life will happen first, and then Taysa's trigger will happen. Mirkwood Bats, Creeping Bloodsucker, and Ayara First of Lockthwain will all deal damage to each opponent just kind of naturally throughout the course of the game. Nadir's Nightblade will trigger whenever a token leaves the battlefield, either your clues or your spirits after they die. An Agent of the Iron Throne will give Taysa the ability to trigger herself when any of your creatures or artifacts go to the graveyard. Acolyte of Aklazots and Drug Recycler are both tapping abilities that will deal table-wide damage. Denethor, Ruling Steward, and Sir Conrad the Grim both have two mana value activated abilities that will trigger some table-wide damage. Extort is really, really good with Taysa Opulent Oligarch. You could probably build an entire deck just around that, but that would get pretty boring after a while, so we only run two. 
Blind Obedience being a very, very good card, and Vizcopa Confessor for being not so great, but kind of spicy on the real real. We've done the damage, we've gotten our clues, now we need ways to get those clues into the graveyard. And we're going to start with Bartolome del Presidio and Defiant Salvager, both sacrifice effects that require no further mana investment. Lobelia, Defender of Bag End, and Fane the Broker can both get an artifact into the graveyard with a simple tap effect. Dockside Chef and Malevolent Noble both have instant speed, repeatable sack outlets. Of course, they do require a little bit of mana each time you use them. Syndicate Trafficker is cheap artifact sacrificing, who will get large and protect itself, and Braids is just fun, since you'll always be wanting to sacrifice artifacts anyways, and you can always sacrifice a spirit to provoke the creature sack if you need. Harmonious Archon and Divine Visitation are two enhancers that will up the normal power and toughness of our spirits. Intangible Virtue and Inspiring Leader are both Anthem-style effects for your tokens. Same goes for Prava the Steel Legion and Soren Lord of Innistrad, though Soren gives the enhancements in the form of emblems, and Prava just gives your tokens big ol' butts. Paladin Class will give you an Anthem effect while giving you a bit of protection on your turn, and Ultramarine's Honor Guard can become multiple Anthems in one card. Cathar's Crusade and Virtue of Loyalty will put counters on all your creatures like all the freaking time. Every turn, cast a creature, whenever. Mirror Entity and Moonshaker Calvary are both huge buffers that can turn your spirit army lethal out of nowhere. We run a few payoffs for all the sacrificing and spirit making. Carmen, Cruel Sky Marcher, and Vito, Fanatic of Aklazots will pay off some of your sacrificing with either a giant Carmen or a bunch of flying vampire demons. Mondrak Glory Dominus will double up on all of your clues and spirits that you make, and it can make itself indestructible by sacrificing some of those clues and or spirits. Reckoner's Bargain, Fanatical Offering, and Deadly Dispute are all variations of the same card. Two mana instant, sack a creature or artifact, draw two cards, and do another minor effect. They are all perfect for a deck like this. Takesia's Welcome and Welcoming Vampire will all welcome your spirits with a card. These only trigger once a turn, but can trigger on opponent's turns, meaning you can get up to four cards around with each of these cards. Benny Brax, Zoologist, and Idol of Oblivion will get a card for making tokens, with Benny having the upside of getting you a card draw each turn. Bag of Devouring will let you sacrifice an artifact or creature to draw a card. I guess you could sack non-tokens and then use the second ability that this card has, but the first one is really where this card shines in this particular deck. Tamio's Journal will get you a clue each upkeep. Then it'll let you sacrifice three clues to let you just straight up Demonic Tutor, and then you can do it again and again and again. There are six interaction spells, and they are all classic Orzhov single target removal, of which I am a sucker for. Anguished Unmaking, Vindicate, and Rite of Oblivion will remove pretty much anything. Rite of Oblivion was basically made for this deck. D-Spark, Fracture, and Mortify are all specific removal. What can I say? I just love the gold. Dam, Hour of Reckoning, and Meat Hook Massacre make up a small but respectable wipe package. To be perfectly honest, wipes are super specific to your meta as far as which ones are the best ones, so I can't really pick which would be the best for you. But since this is an Orzov deck, you're going to have a lot of options, so pick whatever you like the most. This deck has a pretty standard ramp package with Talisman of Hierarchy and Orzov Signet, Felwar Stone, and Mind Stone. Also included is Smothering Tithe and Lotho Corrupt Sheriff. We do spice it up a bit with Cryptolith Fragment, which will be able to trigger clues on Tesa. I don't ever see a scenario where this card gets transformed. I know that's what we all wanted to see. I am, I'm very sorry to disappoint. There's a small package of utility lands that I think are pretty important. But Jukabog is really important. Unlike, unlike most of my Orzhov decks, this deck doesn't really have any tangential graveyard removal. So this is pretty much it. Minas Tirith is a solid option for some extra card draw, considering you should have lots of creatures about that you don't mind just throwing into combat. Phyrexia's Core is just a cheeky way to get extra potential clue sacrifices, and Westvale Abbey is a way to get a big, fat, hard-to-deal-with creature, and, you know, sometimes in token decks, you just need one of those, right? I run 12 Orzhov-producing lands, which are Caves of Koilos, Command Tower, Exotic Orchard, Fitted Heath, Godless Shrine, Isolated Chapel, Marsh Flats, Orzhov Basilica, Scrubland, Shattered Sanctum, Tainted Field, and Vault of Champions. The deck concludes with 10 planes and 10 swamps. The deck will take a long time to get going, and early on you're probably going to end up with a bunch of clues and not much else. But once you have a good engine for making spirits every turn, you can start worrying about getting some enhancements on the board for them. And once you have some of those going, and some aristocrats going, you should be able to close out the game pretty quick. Thank you for watching Element Hobbies. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel and maybe watch another video that YouTube is going to recommend. Take care of yourselves and I will see you around.